The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Hebrews 10, we're looking at verse 9 and 10. Uh, before I move on, I want to do a study on uh, sanctification. Um, th this, uh, this actually begins in verse 5, um, and uh, it actually, from there, uh, through verse 10, what we're studying, I'm down in verse 9 and 10, but where it began in verse 5, and what he's doing, he, he starts out by quoting Psalms 40, which is a Messianic Psalms. He starts in 40, goes through 6 through 8 and quoting and then when we get down to um, uh, verse like 8, 9, 10, he goes into interpreting. And, 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 we, and we've looked at all this. And now he goes back in at 9 and 10. I'm picking up in verse 9 and 10 because I want to deal with sanctification, new covenant sanctification. Verse 9 says, and he said, uh, behold, I come to do thy will. See, that's been the theme. That's kind of like the theme of that Messianic passage of Psalms. If you look at verses 5 through 8 and you pay attention to that, uh, I have come to do your will business, then, and so he carries that idea. Behold, I've come to do thy will. And then he gives a footnote to take away the first, that's the old covenant, in order to establish the second, that's the second covenant or the new covenant. By this will which has been described in Psalms 46 through 8, which is the coming of the Messiah into the world to fulfill the redemptive plan of God. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Right? Once for all. And uh, my subject tonight is going to be, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So that's, that's going to be uh, my subject. Now, as we open up with a word of prayer, we always say that the Bible, mine's kind of a big one tonight, but the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. How do you take care of it? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how you get back out of carnality and back to spirituality. And the spirit is the one who teaches you not only on the learning side, but teaches you on the living side of the word of God. Agreed? So that's important. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. I give you a moment through your priesthood to take care of personal sin. That's your responsibility to confess it in silence and privacy and then offer a prayer for Bible study tonight that God would teach you something about new covenant sanctification that could revolutionize your life, trans put your life into transformational posture. Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and by internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God. Not only on the learning side, but the living side of it, bringing it out into full application under, under pressure. Because pressure doesn't mean a thing to our life anymore because of the grace of God. And all of the operating all of the grace operating assets that you have given us to be overcomers, to be victorious. And so we thank you for that. <laughs> Encourage our hearts tonight by the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Once again, what the writer is doing for us in the, in the book of Hebrews, once again, he's showing the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. And tonight he introduces you to the new covenant doctrine of sanctification. All right, when he says, now I want you to watch certain words here because a lot of time we miss key words. And what I'm trying to do is train you in our Bible study to pay attention to what I call markers. 
and they're right there in the English. All you got to do is be able to see them. For example, notice I I bracketed I the word I, he, and we. Did you see that on your paper? Yeah. I, he, and we. Okay. Then he said, and he's quoting out of Psalms. Then he says, it, uh, way up there in verse 5, Behold, I have come to do your will. That's Jesus Christ has come. Where did he come from? Heaven. Came from heaven to earth, right? In the great scheme of plan. And that's a quote right there. He's quoted part of Psalms 40, verse 7. Um, Behold, I, Jesus Christ, have come to do your will. Who is the he? It's Jesus Christ. He, and listen, what did he come to do? To become our Savior. When he goes to the cross and dies, buried, raised from the dead on the third day, that's the deal. And in that, he takes away the first. You know what Jesus said? I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. Uh, he, takes away, he takes away the first, old covenant, in order to establish the second or the new covenant. See, what the writer has just done is made a, a theological conclusion. Right? He's made a theological conclusion. He has moved us from the Old Testament to the New Testament in the significance of the coming of Christ into the world and completing his mission on the cross. And so he says, he takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, that is the will fulfilled. Jesus said in Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. And it was on the cross. By this will we, those are the saved, we who are saved, we church age believers, by this will, by Christ coming into the world and fulfilling it, by this will we, church age believers, will have been, will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's a pretty powerful idea. What did he do with the old covenant? What did he do with the old covenant? Well, he did, but what's that scripture say? What did he do with it? He took it away. He took it away. Now, the answer to that, Pam, was right. How did he take it away? He fulfilled it. He fulfilled the letter of it. He fulfilled it. That's how he took it away. That, you guys are wonderful because you jump ahead of me. And so... It just shows you how what good students you are. Uh, but, but never jump ahead of the word, okay? Always, always stay, stay as best you can with that. So here we're going to talk about five things about new covenant sanctification because that's what he's talking about. He says, but we are beneficiaries. We have been sanctified uh, through the what? Offering of the body of Jesus Christ. We're sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. In other words... You know, we're familiar with that little symbol we, we write all the time. Uh, Christ goes to the cross. He's buried. He's raised from the dead. We call that the gospel. He dies on that cross when we, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. When we, Romans 1, 16, when we believe the gospel, the gospel is the power of God to save us. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9 Remind us we're saved because we're new covenant. We're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves as a gift of God, right? Uh, and so these are key aspects of this. Now, the moment, the moment you believe that, you are sanctified. You are sanctified. You are sanctified by, by what? What's, it, what's this say? By faith, yeah, we'll get both. Faith by grace, okay? Saved by grace through faith. Saved by, saved by grace through faith, all right? So we're sanctified. Now watch this, because this is new covenant. That's one of eight works of the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. That's one of eight works of the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. That Not only are you sanctified, we'll talk about that in a moment, but there's seven other things the Holy Spirit does for you other than just sanctify you, which means to set you aside, means to set you aside 
as a person in the world who has just got saved from it, out of it, has set you aside as that person, the redeemed of the world, has set you aside unto the holiness of God. So when the Bible comes back and says, and how did we get that? When you believe the gospel, but who sanctified you? The Holy Spirit. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe the gospel, he sanctifies you. That's positional sanctification. There's positional, we'll talk about it next week, but there's positional, experiential, and ultimate. But he, he's going to do that at the point of salvation. That's positional sanctification. You are sanctified. You'll always be sanctified because he offered one, and there's the one. Once for all, that's it. That's part of the once for all. The eight works of the Holy Spirit is part of the once for all, right? How do you get it? By believing the once for all. What's that mean? The gospel, he came and died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. That's a very big deal. That's a big deal. Now, nobody ever had that in the old covenant. Nobody ever had that in the old covenant. This comes with the new, this is new covenant stuff. They're not going to talk about sanctification in the old covenant. That's a discussion of the new covenant. They're going to use the word holy. They're going to talk about holy, which this word comes from. Then I got to talk about it because that's not the issue over there. So I'm going to talk about five things. One, here's the first one. Under old covenant, old covenant theology, sanctification, I gave you the Hebrew word, right? Quadash. It's a, it's, that's the word, be, be set aside for holiness. That's the Hebrew word. It's used primarily as an adjective, holy. When you see that word holy in the Old Testament, that's that, some form of that word. I, that word I put on the, that, that's vocabulary word. It's always a Cal perfect, but it's a vocabulary word. It was used primarily as an adjective uh, connecting. Now listen to me, and I'm going to show you a few of it. In the Old Testament, you can just read, read, tell your heart's content. Just look up uh, in a concordance the word holy. And uh, after about two weeks, you'll cover all that and you'll get a point. But here's the point you will get, connecting, this word holy is connecting something important to a believer with the holiness of God. For example, he's called a holy God, and he's going to tell you, be holy, now that you're a believer, be holy as God is holy. But you can't do that in the flesh, that's for sure. You can be unholy in the flesh <laughs> a pretty good bit, but you can't be holy. And so, and I gave you passages, I gave you a few passages to look at that. Here's another one. He calls it the Holy Scriptures. You see the word holy? You know why? That's a God thing. And you know what the Scriptures are supposed to do? They're supposed to, they're supposed to set you aside unto the holiness of God. And then we have the holy day, like the Sabbath, and a, there's a whole system of Sabbaths that come from it, right? That seventh day is a Sabbath and it's part of a Sabbath system under the law. And, um, and listen, all that whole, every bit of this holy that I'm showing you is connected like the Holy Sabbath. They're all connected. They're all connected to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they're all called holy. For example, I mean, the Holy Scripture, what's it all about? It's from God, about Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy God, the Holy Son, the Holy Spirit. What are, what, and what is it? The Holy Scripture. And the Holy Sabbath, the whole, ha, whole Sabbath system, Jesus in Mark um, 2, 27, 28 says that he, he, he fulfills the Sabbath. Uh, whole, Deuteronomy refers to the Israelites as holy people. Uh, Leviticus 11 says they're to live a holy life. Um, Exodus 19.6 says there are whole, there, there are, were holy priests, the Levitical system. They were holy priests. Uh, and then Exodus 19.6 refers to Israel as a holy nation. We call it the priest nation of Israel. Holy nation. Now, here's my point. All of that holy over here 
is an adjective telling you what God has given you to set you apart in the world unto him. And he wants you to be holy. He's given you all these holy things in order for you to be holy. When it comes to the New Testament, he wraps all that holiness up in the Old Testament. Listen to me now. He wraps all that holiness up in the Old Testament into the person of Jesus Christ. And when he comes, he will sanctify you. He will sanctify you. The whole purpose of the word holy in the Old Testament is to bring this to fulfillment in your life. And at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit places you into sanctification. We call it positional sanctification. Well, in the Old Covenant, for example, Leviticus 19.2, Speak to the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I am the Lord your God. I am holy. You're, to have a, you're supposed to live a holy life, he said, because I'm holy. Well, guess how that worked? Not too good. And, and, and what were they told, what were they given in order to live a holy life? They were given the law. And what the law did was point you to Christ as the only one that could fulfill it. So they all waited for him to come so they, came, they could become uh, a beneficiary of that holiness. They could actually, actually live it out. They never had that privilege one day in their life. We have it every day in ours. Think about that. They didn't have that one day in their life. We have it every day. As, as a possibility in our life because we have been sanctified. We are holy, and we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Word of God within our souls that live it out. It doesn't have to be lived in the flesh. In fact, it can't be. That's ritual without reality, isn't it? That's a code that can't lead to conduct because you can't. James says, to fail in one at one minor point of the laws is to be guilty of all of it. Think about that deal. Boy, he went, I'm so God, I thank God every day. I'm not under that anymore. I guess that's what he said when he said that. I'm probably exaggerating him a little bit, but I'm thinking of myself. You shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. They couldn't do it. You can't either in the flesh. You, we call it playing the game. I call it phony baloney. <laughs> what I call it. New covenant. You know what's wonderful about this? In 1 Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter. We're right next door to it. We go through James. And then we're into Peter. Well, I want you to see something now. I, you got to have your eyes on the Bible now. You got you to gotta pay attention. You got to put your what on? Thinking cap. Now, I, I want to start this conversation with you. I want, I want you to see something. I'm, almost, I'm, I'm in 1 Peter 1. I'm going to do 9 through 16. And I want you to pay, I want, first of all, I want you to pay attention. I'm going to go 9 through 12. I'm going to go 9 through 12. That's one section. Then I'm going to go through 13 through 16. That's another section. Are you with me? Yeah, okay, here we go. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith, faith the salvation. That's a point now. That's a big point. The salvation of your souls. The salvation of your souls. Now as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry. Who's, what prophets are you talking about? Old covenant prophets. What are they talking about? Salvation. What are they talking about? They're talking about the day when it would be completed. Right? The completion of redemption. Now as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that w would come to you made careful search and inquiry. See, the, who the you is is us. 
seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ, this is the Old Testament prophets looking ahead of the grace of God that was to come with Christ, seeking to know what person, they don't know the person, they just know he's coming. See, John had that dilemma. Who is the Christ? Who is the Christ? Who is God? How did, how did he discover it? How did John the Baptist discover it? By baptizing, what, and the, God had told him, the Spirit of God will come down upon you, whom you see at rest business. Mm -hmm. uh, John, the first chapter. Seeking to know what person or time, Roman, uh, like Galatians 4.4, 4, that we're talking about the incarnation time when he come into the world. Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating. In other words, that's the Spirit of Christ speaking about Christ in prophecy, within them was indicating as he predicted the suffering of Christ and the glories to follow. It, listen, has Christ come and suffered for our sins? Yes. You know what, what, what then are we living in? If that's true, then what do we have? What follows the suffering of Christ for those who follow him? What's it say? The glories, the glories. The glories, the glories in time and eternity, the glories, the glories of God in Christ are now ours. Oh, you should read, oh, listen to me. You should read John 17 in this great prayer he prayed for me and you before he left the earth. It's about the glories. Oh, it's a wonderful prayer if you understand what he said. Now, it, now, I'm in verse 12. It was revealed. It was revealed to them, these prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you. See, that's at Hebrews 11, 39 through 40. Right? Oh, listen. This is, this, he's already telling you what he's going to tell you. That's a good teacher. He tells you what he's going to tell you, and he tells you, and then he tells you what he told you. Okay? I usually run out of time, but my heart is there. But you, in these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the what? The gospel of what? Salvation. What kind of salvation? Grace. That's what these prophets of old time were preaching. That would come with the coming of Christ. Preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Are you kidding? Listen, even the prophets long to live in that. They got to see these things prophetically, never got to see them historically. We got to see them historically. We look back to prophets and say, wow. But let me tell you about the glories in which we live in because the suffering of Christ and the cross, we live in the glories. Listen to what this says. And we live in the time of, what, what, of things which angels long to see. They would have given their right foot. No, I don't know, Pam. Pam, that might be sensitive to Pam tonight. <laughs> but you know what I mean. So, look, we, we, we have it for granted. And that's okay because granted means grace for us. We, have the, we, we live in the period of grace the things into which angels long to see, to look. We have it, quote, for granted. That's so amazing. Now watch. Now I'm into 13 through 16. I'm about to get where I'm at. See the word therefore? Therefore is why for. So, so that's why I had to go back to verse 9, 10, 11, and 12. Because of the word, therefore, it forced me to do that. It wasn't hard to force me, by the way, but I had to do that. See, yeah, therefore, why for? Mm -hmm. Listen to this one. This is one we quote. 
Gird your loins for action. Keep sober in the spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace. This is a grace they, they, they prophesied about that would come with Christ that brings us into the glories of life in time and eternity. And it's a gift of grace. It's a gift. Grace is a gift. Not of works, least the man should boast. Agreed? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Look, gird your mind for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in ignorance. But, now watch here, here's my text. But like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourself also in all of your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's Leviticus 11.44. This was something they strive for that could never attain. It was something that would come with Christ. It would come with grace and would bring you into the glories of his coming, both first and second. Whew, oh, that's so good. My goodness, people, that's so good. In Hebrews 9, 26, we paid attention to a special, a special phrase but now once at the consummation of the ages, okay, that's us, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's Hebrews 9.26. Now, here's the second point. Hey, the first point would be enough, wouldn't it? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? That's a whole lot of stuff right there. Under the new covenant, under the new covenant, sanctification became a major theological doctrine connected with the first coming of Christ into the world as Savior of mankind. Do you know I am, now this is a, this is a big doctrine for the church, right? I mean, they, prof, they prophesied this thing. I mean, that, that Peter's showing that. Uh, the Hebrews writer is showing that. Now, it's inexcusable. For you not to understand sanctification, it's inexcusable. It is a major doctrine of your Christian faith. It's inexcusable. This week I'm going to talk about it. Next week I'm going to talk about it because it's a major doctrine. It's a one-on-one -on -one doctrine because that's baby stuff right there. Agreed? Right. First Peter 2, 2, newborn babes, that's recently converts, have a desire, have a sincere desire to learn the basics, the milk, what, it, what you have to give them. Hebrews 5.13, you got to give them milk. This is milk. This is not meat. This is not deep theology. This is, this is named pablum. This is back to mother's breast stuff. And I am amazed how many people in the Christian church does not understand sanctification. And it is a, is it a big, it's, it is a big doctrine. And that's why I felt led to spend some time with it because it is a major doctrine. And buddy, we need to get this one under our belt, as we say. Now watch, in Hebrews 10, 5, listen, what he, listen where sanctification comes, comes. Therefore, this was in verse 10, 5, therefore, when he comes into the world, you're not going to have it until he comes into the world. It was all prophetic. Agreed? We just studied it. Yeah, okay. I tell you, you guys make me earn my money. I can tell you that. That's okay because I love teaching you because, but you, 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 you make me earn it. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of it is written of me, Old Testament, to do your will, O God. Look at verse 7. Then I said, oh, that was it. Uh, then he said, behold, I've come to do your will, to take away the first, to establish the second. Let's see, that was probably in what, verse 9 or 10? That's 10, 10, isn't it? Is that 10, 10? I didn't put it down. Is that 10, 10? Okay, put that down because I didn't. 
or I might have next. By this will, by this will, we have been sanctified. By what will? See, that, that's that whole salvation package right here, right? By that will right there. He's coming to the world to go to the cross, right? That whole business, the gospel, the gospel. They, they preach the gospel is coming. The gospel is coming. Okay. And what do we get? We get sanctified. That's one of eight works. That's one of eight, but it's a big one. That is a big one. And I, I'm going to bring it back. I'm just introducing it to you tonight. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. How many times? Once for all. Is it when you get when you believe the gospel of Christ, you get that. That's a once for all deal. This is not a continuous thing. He's not. Listen, if you have to go back and get saved again, then he's got to come back and die again. You understand that? That ain't going to happen. It's a one. It's a once for all deal. It's a once for all deal. <laughs> what can I tell you? I, I don't have to be clear on that. It's a once for all deal. For by this one offering. Now watch. See the offering in verse verse 10. It's going to come back, that, 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 that offering of the body of Christ once for all, that's going to come back in verse 14 later. For by this one offering, he has perfected for all, for how long? Oh, 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 how long? Oh. All time. Those who are what? Sanctified. How do I get sanctified? Sanctified. Right there. I've got to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Takes me in. Takes me in. Now I'm going to show you something. I didn't put this on you. Did I, did I give you the verbal form of perfected? Huh? Did I? Okay. No, I wrote the word, but did I put it in the Greek? No. Oh, okay. I want to do that. I want to show you something. Because this is, there's, there are times when the Greek language is this powerful. And here's one of them. T-E-L-E-I-O-O -O was the verb, teleo-o. -O. That's the word perfect, complete, finished. This is what he said on the cross, teteleastai. It is finished. Okay? And listen, he means the same thing here because in John 19.30, when he said it is finished from the cross, teteleastai, it was a perfect tense. It is a perfect tense here. This is a perfect, active Indicative. What's the perfect tense? Tell, tell me what the perfect tense means in the Greek language. Comple completed in the past with the results it remains completed forever. That's the perfect tense. I mean, you can get any first year Greek book and read it, and he'll tell you that. I, I'm not telling you anything anybody who takes Greek doesn't know. Now, now listen what he said. For by this one offering, he has perfected for how long? <laughs> it tells you how long the perfect tense is. He went ahead. For, for how long? Oh, just for some time. Oh. All right. All right. Why don't you claim that verse? Well, let's go to the verse in it. When do, I mean, when do I get sanctified? Mm, at the point of salvation. By the Holy Spirit. How long? Perfect. Perfect tense. I am. This work is finished in me because it was finished on the cross. It is finished in me. And listen, it, when it's finished on the cross, it not only picks me, but it fulfills everybody from the Old Testament on. Right? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. Sure. Here we go. Point three. The entire New Testament theology of sanctification. Hegiasmos. You know what it means? It means the same thing the, that it meant in the Hebrew. It, no. It means to be set apart into holiness. Yeah. Holy is an adjective of the idea. See, the Hebrew word and the Greek word means the same thing. Okay, but the interpretation is different, Pam. In the Old Testament, we're talking about holy okay. as connected believer. Listen to me now. But in the New Testament, we're talking about holiness in the believer. Sanctified. Listen, that's why we're called saints. Actually, the word saint is the word holy in the Greek. It's hagios. Wow. 
and, and Haggai, uh, saint, comes right out of the word sanctified. Saint and sanctified is identical. You go into the sanctuary. Some people do. All right. Uh, the entire New Testament theology is, is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ of grace salvation as we've talked about. Now, on your paper, you need to make a change. Uh, the Hebrew is not Hebrews 3.12. It's 13.12. Mm -hmm. 13, 12. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his what? Blood. Now look, earlier in, in, chapter, in chapter 10, 9 and 10, he said we were sanctified through what? No, no, in, that, in the text. I'm talking about, you're right, but in the text. Back there, sanctified through the offering of the what? The body, the offer, offer of the body of Jesus Christ. Now he comes back and he tells you, yes, but also by the offering of the blood. And then he talks about outside the gate. Okay. Now, in Acts 26, 18, Paul is, in, Paul is given a pers personal testimony. Paul, this is important. Paul is given his personal testimony. And. And Paul's explaining how he got saved as a Jew, as a religious Jew, how he got saved on the road to, to Damascus, how he got saved, and how it had changed his life dramatically. And he's in a discussion. He's in court. And he, he makes a statement. Now, now, this whole thing, you got to, when you read it, go, go back to context and read. He's in court and read his whole testimony in court. I'm just pulling a few out, a few statements out of his testimony. He says, and, and he's talking about why he was called of God to go to the Gentiles. He said, I've been called of God to go to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the domain of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance, receive an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. When he says me, he's talking about Jesus Christ because this is what Jesus Christ told him. In other words, you go back to verse 15 and read. Now, I want to show you something. See that word sanctified? Still in the perfect tense, by the way. In this text, it's still in the perfect tense. That word sanctified is a present passive participle. Still in the perfect tense. An inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. Put by the word, by the way, he puts a definite article with the word faith, pistis. Paul's testimony. How how long is how long is the perfect tense? Forever. The writer said, for all time. Perfect tense even goes beyond that for all time and eternity. <clears throat> Sometime you ought to go back and read Paul's testimony in chapter 26. It's pretty enlightening stuff. Point number four. New covenant sanctification is one of eight works of the Holy Spirit, the moment of grace salvation. <clears throat> I want you to put your eyes on this passage. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians th uh, uh, 6. I, I want to show you. What what the power of uh, the power of the gospel and sanctification? What it means to your life? The power of the gospel to save you, and saving you. What saving should mean to your life? I'm in the sixth chapter of First Corinthians. Let's see where did I pick this thing up? Nine. I'm going to start with nine. Do you not know? 
that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not, do not be deceived. And he lists, he list, I don't know, nine. I forgot to count them. About nine lifestyles. These are lifestyles. Fornicators, idolatries, uh, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunks, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. So he says, nor, and he goes through that list, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, listen, now, what, now watch carefully what he says. But, some, but this is the Corinthian church. That's why the door ought to be open to everybody who will believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, not based on their background. It's based on, on their foreground, where they're headed. Listen to me. And such, and such were some of you. This is a Corinthian church. Now, how does he know who they are? He saved them. He personally saved these people. Do you not know the people that you led to Christ, what their background was? I'll tell you, they knew mine. <laughs> they knew mine. Unbeknowing to me, it seemed like everybody seemed to know mine. And such were some of you, but watch what happened. When they believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, they got cleansed, sanctified, and justified. He mentions three things. Cleansed, washed, cleansed, sanctified, and justified. You know how they got that? Grace. You know why? Because Christ offered his body and blood. And when you believe it, God saves you. And he saves you from the worst lifestyles of the culture. See, these were cultural lifestyles that were destroying cultures. This is how you tank a nation. These are the, these are, these are the lifestyles that sink a nation. These are cultural lifestyles that sink a nation as far as a divine institution. As far as a divine institution, these are some of the things that tank a nation. You should pay attention to that list. And you know what salvation should do? Deliver you from that. Come on now. Should that not deliver you? Cleansed, sanctified, justified, you are now into a new life in Christ. Don't let the old life drag you down, and don't let people who knew you in the old life drag you down. You hold on to the new life in Christ. I mean, I love this passage. I read this. I mean, this is one of my deals right here. I love this. I look at that and think, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because I'd have been in one of those lifestyles, plus many more probably. But God in his grace, the good sense... One day to come to my senses, that I don't want to do. I don't want to live this way anymore. Listen, I was, I was 23, and I was already sick of my life. I was 23. I, I can't imagine being 53. I was sick of my life. I was 23 and sick of it. And I came from a good background, not a religious background. Thank God. They're the hardest people to come out of. The hardest people to get saved are religious people who think they're okay because they do good things. What they are is moral. Moral ain't going to get you to heaven. Going to church ain't going to get you to heaven. Boy, if you think that, you're going to have a tough day in the next life. Don't believe that foolishness. That's not true. And such were some of you. You were, you were washed or cleansed, but you were sanctified. You were, look at, but you were. Look at this word. But you were, but you were, but you were. That's past tense. Listen, but you were. They've gone beyond salvation. Now he's talking to people in the church who have gone beyond that. That's 101 salvation talk. That's all basic doctrine stuff. That's a 101. That's milk. But you were. Listen, now he talks about you were this, and then he says, but you were. They're, they're beyond that. Do you understand? If you're still drinking milk, Something desperately wrong with your eating habits. And you shouldn't be set in some place that's not being fed. You should be set in some place that can actually feed you and enlighten you. 
rather than keep you in blind darkness. And thank God you are. Thank God you are. Thank God you are. But you're missing something. Such, such were some of you. And then he says, but you were cleansed, washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. That's all salvation stuff talk. But he said, now, that, 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 see, we're talking about the book of Corinthians. Now he's ready to, listen, we got to get, get going. See, you're missing something. In 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, he said, I'm having a lot of difficulty with you people in the church because you're carnal. You come to church, you, you're carnal. You stay carnal. I can't teach you. I have to go back to elementary things. You ought to read 1 Corinthians 3 because I'm in 6. It gets better the farther you go and the longer it takes him to preach. I imagine by the time he got to the end of this book, there were very few people in the church still with him. New people were coming in probably because they wanted to hear the good news. The old people were sick and tired of hearing it because they wanted to live carnal and not spiritual. Well, I don't know. See, how were, how were you cleansed? How were you sanctified? How were grace? <laughs> grace. Grace is one of the great doctrines you could ever hear. Grace. You were cleansed by grace. You were, you were sanctified by grace. You were justified by grace. This is the greatest message in the whole wide world in our day. Gosh. Grace. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Uh, uh, 13, it should be 13, not 3. Hey, hey, 13 and 14. But we should always give thanks to God for you. I don't know how often you pray for me, and that's, a, that's between you and the Lord. But I tell you how often I pray for you. Several times a day. I do. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm reminded by God that I should always give thanks to God for you because you're positive the word of God. You come when the doors are open. You set with a pen and a mind ready to... to to do what you've got to do, and you do it. And I am so thankful to God for that. But we have to have more people with us. And we've got, to, we've got to reach into a younger group of people for this to catch hold. We, we, we've, got, we've got to get on the stick because... There are a whole lot of people out there that need to hear this. A lot of people need to hear this message. We should always give thanks to God for you. Always give thanks to God for you. Brethren beloved by the Lord. Don't you love that? Brethren beloved by the Lord. That's, that, you, know, those are, you know, those are status privileges right there. Those names, those titles given to you. You don't earn those. You don't earn them. They're given to you by the grace of God. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Holy Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we live in that glory. I mean, we live in the day of the glory, the glories of God that are revealed through his son. We live in that day. That's not a future for us. It's a now. I'm not waiting to die to get that. This, I, I'm waiting to live to get this. This is an everyday for all the time, all the time. Live in the glories of God. Live in the glories of God. Let me close. All three members of the Godhead, some people call it the Trinity, are involved in new covenant sanctification. I just threw a few verses out here for you. Let me run through them quick and then we'll call it a night. 
For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father. And that good. All from one father. That those of you that have a father. That probably don't have a, a large meaning. It does to me that when I read that. I mean, I could weep. But I'm a big boy and don't. But I could weep. Because I got me a one father. I finally got me a one father. I didn't know my other one. But I know this one. And I know this one for sure. For both he who is saying for that are all from one father. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus calls me brother. He calls me brother. You know why? I got the same father. He calls me brother. When I get to heaven, he's going to give me a big five and say, hey, brother. Hey, brother. <laughs> yeah, if I can get through the gate, uh, it may take me a week to get through the gate with all the things he's, he said. You know how many times you said that? Well, here they are. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm. Gosh, I hope you remember all the good, all the good things I taught you in the word of God, because you sure got the others. <laughs> I know, you got that. You sure do. <laughs> uh, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. You see the Trinity? All of it right there. All of it working on my behalf. All of that working on my behalf. My goodness, people, why would you? Here's one, 1 Corinthians 1.30. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Finally, Romans 15.16, which is a powerful idea for Paul. To be, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I love that. I tell you that, Paul. He was so thankful. So thankful. Well, Marion, it looks like you got duty. Remember Horton. Uh, Horton, you this next week, right? Sure. Back to Pennsylvania to wrap up uh, another couple thousand kids in a camp. So remember him out there and, and uh, yeah, what a wonderful opportunity. And um, I tell you, uh, and I was talking to Horton Saturday at the men's prayer breakfast about this. And he's seen it too. I mean, th there's a, there is a bright light in the eyes of young Christians today. Young, I'm talking about high school, college age kids. I tell you, I, I see that look in their eye that I, I saw back in the 60s and 70s. I am really getting excited. <laughs> I am really getting excited because I see some really good, all they need to do is be fed and led. Fed and led. And we need to be in that position to do it, boy. I mean, thank you, Horton. Thank you for being out there on that front line with these kids. Yeah, boy, because... Uh, okay, let's do it. Oh, well, okay. I got it. That's right. Thank you. Father, we're so thankful for this group that's come with us today by automobile and by internet for a discussion on sanctification. We'll get into mechanics next week with this subject matter. Uh, we just dealt with salvation and positional sanctification. We'll deal with the rest next week just to bring awareness back to this important doctrine in the New Covenant. And I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God within our souls uh, that we might live as holy people sanctified and live that out in our life in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ who knew no sin be sent.